Hello, everyone. We hope you enjoyed your meal. So going back to the agenda, next in line we have a keynote speech by Samantha Beres, the Chief Executive Officer of Gibraltar Financial Services Commission. Samantha Beres became uh, the CEO of the, of the Gibraltar Financial Services Commission on February 2014. She was previously an Executive Director at the Solic Solicitors Regulatory Authority in the UK. Prior to that, Samantha's career included 10 years in the Financial Services Authority, the FSA, in the UK. She began, work, uh, she began her career at uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand as an economist focusing on monetary policy, strategy, and economic reform. Please. So, um, good afternoon. It's great to, great, great to be here and to uh, have the opportunity to speak at this conference. I almost didn't make it um, to, here. I got caught up, I don't know whether any of you are aware, I got caught up in the Gatwick uh, stoppage yesterday when the air traffic control system went down for about two hours. And it was a really good example for me of how reliant we've all become on IT systems, technology, to manage our everyday lives. And so I was caught up along with thousands of people at Gatwick, thinking at first that I wouldn't be able to make it here at all, and that my colleague Nathan Catonia, who's, who's known to many of you, would have to don a wig and be up here in, 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 in my stead. But I managed to get one of the few planes that, that got out last night, only to find when I arrived here that they'd lost my suitcase. So at about 2.30 in the morning, I was uh, running around with a taxi driver in Barcelona trying to find a 24-hour pharmacy so I could at least take my contact lenses out. So I, and, and therefore have needed to do a shopping trip this morning, um, which is a hardship, uh, of course. Um, so it's, it's, <laughs> this is my first time in Barcelona. I've been really looking forward to coming. It hasn't, it's been a bit stressful uh, to start with, but Nathan's looking out for some good restaurants this evening, and I'm counting on a good, uh, a good, a good, a good Spanish meal. Uh, some of the people here at this conference will know who I am, given that I've granted a license at some point in the not too distant past. Uh, but as I said, I'm, C I'm CEO, uh, so leading the Gibraltar Financial Services Commission, and I think critically for the purpose of this conference, we've been working with the government of Gibraltar to launch uh, at the beginning of 2018 the first comprehensive regulatory regime for businesses who use DLT to store or transmit value. And I don't know about you, but um, when I was first kind of getting into understanding the DLT space, regulatory regime for DLT almost strikes me as an oxymoron. And I wonder how many of you and the people at the conference here find it a bit strange to hear crypto and regulation in the same breath. Uh, and indeed, I wonder how many uh, started their journey into crypto as almost anarchists and were drawn to crypto because they didn't like central authorities having a say in, in, in what they do. And, and I, get, I get that. I originally uh, started off my career not just as an economist, but as a free market economist, very skeptical on the value of regulation, which is kind of a weird thing given I've turned up spending, having a career as a regulator. That's because I grew up in New Zealand at a time when it was one of the most overregulated uh, and poorly regulated economies in the OECD. And the, in the 1970s and 1980s, I was living through as a child the effects of exchange controls, import controls, price and rent controls that made people homeless in practice. And so I was kind of sat in the front seat of what regulation done badly can deliver. But, and the reason that I am in regulation is that I genuinely believe, and, and, and this has been my life's work, that regulation, when done well, is extremely beneficial and, and indeed essential. So the problem is that when done badly, complying with regulation can have you swamped by process, making your business more expensive and frustrating without any particularly discernible impact on consumer protection or system stability. However, one, when done well, You'd be surprised, and I've been surprised, how many uh, in the DLT space with anarchist sympathies see the value in being regulated. And why is this? And, and what I want to do is give you a regulator's perspective on DLT and some key trends which are emerging on the regulatory front. And 
you know, to some extent, let's start with that. I wonder whether there's a misconception that regulators, or a partial misconception, that regulators are either dragging their heels or a flat out anti-crypto, uh, you, know, uh, you know, are regulators really like this? And I found, and particularly in a growing way over the last two to three years, the reality is that most regulators are really interested in the role that virtual assets and virtual assets regulation can play in supporting the safe development of businesses that have the potential to provide enormous benefits to the economy and consumers. And I'm deliberately using the term virtual assets as this is what's being used to describe crypto assets at the FATF, that's the Financial Action Task Force, which is the international uh, crime-fighting agency. And I'll pick up on that a bit more later. But before I continue, I, I just want to emphasize uh, how difficult regulating this space is because it often seems to me that we're regulating something where both the goal as well as the goalposts are constantly moving. And both the goal and the goalposts are digital, freely transferable, and sometimes decentralized. And, and it's a truism that the past few years have seen technology evolving at an incredible pace. Uh, that's affecting our day-to-day -day lives in a multitude of ways. And this is massively challenging for the current legal and regulatory systems, which are constantly and continuously playing catch up. And the challenge for regulators, and it's good to have some sympathy because it's really hard, is to react appropriately, delivering our protection objectives whilst continuing to allow the innovation to take place. But it is important that we as regulators step up to the task because more than ever, it's the case that if systems, including regional, domestic, global, regulatory and legal systems, fail to keep up with rapidly advancing technology, these systems will fail to protect consumers, fail to secure stable economies and will cut across the innovation that will benefit society. Just recently, we've got governments and regulators expressing concern with Libra, and some have asked Facebook to pause its efforts until a clear regulatory response can be arrived at. And a number of, and I know the French Central Bank has, um, has, has recently also said it's taking a real interest in this, and I think we can understand why. And a number of business, new business models are springing out of nowhere over the past few years, and they're constantly pushing the conventional regulatory norms. And this is before even contemplating the fundamental shift in society if we move to a more decentralized and peer-to-peer -peer economy, which could result uh, as DLT continues to be adopted. So let us think on the changes and challenges, for example, that Airbnb and Uber have brought to the hotel and taxi industries. Something Barcelona, I understand, is very familiar with, given the response here with respect to ride-hailing apps. And we're also experiencing how innovation is pushing boundaries in, in fintech beyond the potential for faster transaction settlement. Because in DLT, we're seeing a technology that could fundamentally alter market structures and reshape business relationships throughout the financial services sector and beyond. And given the difficulty to catch up and the ever-changing environment, I'm sure you can appreciate that this area is a real challenge for regulators. But it is important that regulators get on top of the challenge. I sometimes think trying to stop innovation, actually I had this, uh, I've been having to deal with this in my garden over the weekend, is like kind of concreting over grass. Eventually the grass grows back through, but not perhaps in the areas you wanted it to. So uh, it is, you know, I don't think regulators have a choice. We have, to get to, we have to get to grips with it. We have to put the time into understanding it and understanding the benefits, not in a defensive way, but because, because of the potential benefits that there are for society. And it is a challenge which many of my peers and counterparts in other regulatory bodies are actively seeking to rise to. There's a lot of work being done by regulators, much of it behind the scenes. Uh, and much of, this, but much of this behind the scenes work is coming to fruition and we can see some great policy work underway resulting in regulatory changes uh, in a variety of regulatory forums. So where is regulatory thinking at? Where are regulators at on this stuff? Uh, and the fact is that virtual assets are becoming a much higher priority. So FATF is um, 
bringing in virtual asset service providers or VASPs. I said, asked Nathan, is it VASPs or is it VOSPs? But I'll stick with VASPs into its recommendations and has been working on virtual currency since about as far back as 2014. So clearly a lot of work's gone into considering the AML CFT risks associated with virtual assets. But in time, VASPs will need to be registered or authorized and regulated by national level competent authorities, regulators such as me the world over. And we knew that AMLD, uh, the Anti-Money Laundering Directive 5 in the EU, and uh, I suppose there, I mean, Gibraltar is a part of the EU through the UK member states membership of the EU. So we're currently part of the EU when, if, in whatever fashion, the UK le leaves the EU, Gibraltar will be leaving the EU with the UK. But for now, uh, we're very much part of the EU. So AMLD5 uh, is, is very relevant to us. So AMLD5 is going to bring about certain requirements. Uh, and this was generally targeted at fiat to crypto exchanges and custodial wallet providers. But the next wave of financial crime regulation globally, uh, which is going to align national legislation with the latest international FATF uh, recommendations, will extend this crypto will extend this to crypto to crypto exchanges and impose uh, the travel rule on VASPs where certain data will need to be shared when transfers of virtual assets occur between two VASPs. I'm really aware that this is a very controversial development. Uh, and many of you, many of the attendees at the conference here may be concerned by the additional regulatory burden. But these developments, in my view, are a step in the right direction. Um, I may sound biased as a regulator, but don't forget I started off as a free market economist. And regulation is exactly what the industry needs to be able to bridge the gap between what could be characterized as a crypto wild west of the past and the adoption and mainstreaming of virtual assets and distributed ledger in the future. IOSCO, the International Organization of Securities Commissions, uh, and we're a member, have been active in this area and during May of this year released a consultation paper on issues, risks, and regulatory considerations relating to crypto asset trading platforms. This again isn't a knee-jerk reaction to recent developments, but a result of much work and which we have been part of. And as I also work to consider virtual assets in some form and, and what should regulators think about them. And and in fact, you know, it is such a priority, it is, uh, I also have said that working through these issues uh, has become a board level priority for 2019. And just for IOSCO, for those of you who aren't aware, in a, in, a, in a bit of context, it is the international standard setter for securities regulators. So it will be the key standard setter for tokenized securities, uh, any, of, any of the markets as they, as they, as they start to and as they do take on a form and business model which is very analogous to traditional organized markets uh, and, uh, and securities markets. What I also do in this space is something that is of interest to all of you, I think. And both FATF and IOSCO are international organizations and what they're doing is they're prioritizing a thoughtful understanding, so not a knee-jerk reaction, of how to view crypto and fintech developments from from, their, from the perspective of their public interest obligations. At the EU level, ESMA has also issued a number of statements uh, and they are the European Securities Authority over the last few years as well. So today, I actually believe most policymakers and legislators are cautiously, because they're policymakers and legislators, monitoring the progress of the industry and ensuring that where virtual assets fall in scope of current regulatory regimes, that the entities are uh, impacted comply appropriately with legislative requirements. And this is a recent hot topic given that the industry, as I said before, is moving to tokenized and digital securities. And it's likely that more securities will be tokenized going forward. And what that means is that, as I said before, the full panoply of securities regulation will apply uh, that is currently there in the traditional space. So clearly this is a time when regulators really need to, stay, to take a step back, understand the reason 
and the objectives of regulation and ensure that they respond proportionately and effectively, always bearing in mind our regulatory objectives. And I think that uh, perhaps better than previous times of impactful regulation, regulators are really doing this. Uh, and why are they doing this? And for it to land well, it means that we need to work together to build societies that can benefit from new safe innovations, either without unnecessary impediments or crises from new regulation going, from new innovation going wrong and causing harm. And that those in the driving seat of crypto understand and embrace the objectives that public interest bodies the world over has, have, has their mission. And this is critical. To land the, to land the goal that I think everyone shares, which is benefiting society, benefiting the unbanked at the moment, benefiting those who can't get access to insurance services, benefit, you know, benefiting societies, helping them to live their lives easier. It's critical that uh, we as regulators uh, avoid undue prescription and that those who are driving the new technology really get the objectives that we're trying to achieve. So let's, let's flick through those. Um, you know, the effort, you know, what, what are the objectives? The good functioning of markets, consumer protection, integrity, competition, the prudential regulatory authority, safety and soundness, IOSCO, protecting investors, markets that are fair and transparent, reducing systemic risk, ESMA, the European authority, enhancing investor protection, promoting orderly and stable financial market. These are really powerful objectives and there's a lot of consistency across regulators in terms of the outcomes that they're seeking to achieve. And in Gibraltar, our objectives actually combine that of many of those different regulatory bodies and we've got oversight of a number of functions of what we do. So here, if you take a look at our, um, our objectives, again, they're very similar. The promote confidence, systemic risk, public awareness, a good reputation uh, of the jurisdiction, which is essential for those who want to be regulated by us, that, we, that, that our regulation, our jurisdiction has a good reputa reputation, the protection of consumers and crime. But just taking a step back, again, why regulate? And by and large, global, the, the economies that we have today, global, regional, and local are market economies. They are driven by the pursuit of profit, uh, and that's not a bad thing, because one of the reasons why the market economy has such a grip is it is the most efficient and effective way to date in the history of the world to deploy and invest capital to meet the needs of the nearly 8 billion people alive on the planet. However, market forces don't always, for example, deliver in the best interests of consumers, particularly when they're exposed to risks that they cannot protect themselves from. And that's why one of the key, what key objectives of regulation exists. We need to protect, we seek to protect consumers from harm. We also seek to protect consumers from risk that they don't understand. We also need to acknowledge the, pres the continuous presence of people who lack integrity, who seek to gain an economic advantage from acting dishonestly. As much as I would love to believe that we live in the midst of a Disney, mo um, Disney movie, we don't. There are people whose integrity and honesty is less than those that, 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 that society wishes to promote. And, it is, and, and, and we also have people who are running businesses that they just do not have the competence to be able to run. And that is, that is a key protection that regulators are here to, to deliver. What we don't want to do is crowd out innovation especially innovation which is going to improve efficiency and effectiveness. I really believe that DLT is a technology that has the potential to make consumers' lives easier and safer, help to help their lives to become safer and markets to work better. And forward-thinking regulators get that. They show a lot of interest, they see the benefits, they're working to make sure that we don't crowd out innovation whilst at the same time doing our part to manage any risk that innovation could do harm. In Gibraltar, we've got a very outcomes-focused, principles-based approach to regulating in this area, and it's designed to allow businesses a lot of flexibility to explore the applications in this rapidly evolving technology whilst maintaining the protection of consumers and the jurisdiction's reputation. 
And our regulatory approach allows us um, to continuously adapt our regulatory response. You know, we have not started off with a whole ton of really detailed rules um, so that we can make, take a bespoke regulatory approach to the activity which we are regulating. Um, and I just want to pause on the reputation because it's important to remember, um, you know, one of the things that we've found when we've been bringing new licensees in is sometimes we've been teaching them what it means to be regulated. And, uh, and we've had some really good conversations, but one of the conversations that we've had with them has been, look, when we or any other regulator authorize or license you, you're not only un getting an authorization to undertake a regulated activity, the reason that you're coming to us to be regulated is that you want our reputation. And that's something that has value, and it's value for those in the systems we need to protect, and value for licensed businesses as well. It has to mean something to be authorized and regulated, and it's not just a process of taking down names and addresses. And we've had a lot of fun uh, working with licensees who've come to us as, as, we've, as, as, we've, as we've kind of worked those um, work those through. And the regulation brings reputation and it fuels adoption in the virtual asset space. And working well, it's a partnership between regulator and regulated firms. And some regulators, not many these days, but some regulators don't like the term partnership uh, between, regulated, uh, and, uh, between regulator and regulated firms. But actually, I think that's what it is. It's working together um, to deliver shared, shared outcomes. And what I'm just quickly going to touch on is authorization and supervision of our DLT providers in Gibraltar. And you'll be happy to hear that I'm not going to bore you with the intricate details of the authorization process, although Nathan and I are happy to uh, sort of pick that up with you over a cup of coffee afterwards. But what I do want to do is highlight some of the approaches we've taken, which I think have been very beneficial in allowing us to uh, apply a proportionate approach to each firm which has gone through the licensing process. So, and due to the number of forms that a DLT provider could take, it's, ex it's been extremely important for us to really understand exactly what entities were doing and how exactly they were using DLT to store or transmit value in order to be able to understand the risks. And this is a simple question and answer for some of the more traditional fiat to crypto exchanges and even crypto to crypto exchanges where all private keys are being held by the same firm. However, boundaries are being pushed due to what we all know is decentralization. And, um, and decentralization is actually quite difficult for regulators to grasp. After you, how do you regulate something which is decentralized? And after working with this industry for some time, now I tend to spin the question around and ask, well, what does decentralization mean to you? Was Ether Delta decentralized? Our counterparts in the SEC certainly didn't think so. And what we're coming to realize, and I'm sure others will follow suit, is that decentralization isn't a yes or no answer question. There, there may be instances where a virtual asset is very centralized. However, through certain hard forks or distribution of nodes, for example, it becomes more decentralized as time goes by. Eventually, we could move from a state of centralization to that of full decentralization. And the challenge from a regulatory standpoint are those cases where it's actually not particularly clear whether an activity is centralized or decentralized, and where there is a point in the middle where we have an extremely gray area. And in these cases, we as regulators need to exercise significant judgment in order to apply the most adequate and proportionate approach to these activities. So you can see why it needs to be a partnership, because we need to really understand what you're doing. And because we don't, on the one hand, want to impose requirements that simply don't fit or work with the technology. On the other hand, we need to protect consumers. And there have been a number of cases where projects, particularly in the ICO space, have dubbed themselves to be operating in a decentralized and unregulatable manner. And in some cases, I'm sure that's true. However, there are also cases where this simply hasn't been true. I mean, I am not, as Nathan will tell you, an experienced Solidity developer. However, I was intrigued to see that certain functions in a smart contract can only be called by a contract owner. And I kind of paused to reflect on this. A decentralized smart contract has an owner. So maybe you can see where I'm coming from here. So although the smart contract is deployed onto the Ethereum blockchain, it's public and transparent. The fact that there is an owner means that in this case, the smart contract isn't decentralized despite running on decentralized technology. 
And it's these cases that we need to consider, at least in Gibraltar, due to the scope of our DRT framework. And it's this, you know, is this group of people, this person or this business, storing or transmitting value belonging to others? If that question is yes, then you need to be, regu you need to be regulated, authorized and regulated uh, in Gibraltar. And this is not to say that we will apply a disproportionate level of regulation to these providers which fall in scope. The beauty of our framework is that we've got, um, because it's so outcomes focused, uh, and as long as we're working in really good partnership uh, with, with, the firms, with, with our firms, we can really make sure that it's very proportionate if it's the business model that you're operating. So what we do, I've set up the nine principles. You don't need me to read those out. These are the high-level outcomes that, uh, so these are, these are the regulatory, essentially, these are broadly the regulatory requirements of our DLT regime. And we apply them in a way which is proportionate. We engage in dialogue with firms and ensure that the individuals who are running those firms are fit and proper, that they're competent, have the right attitude to run a regulated entity, uh, and treat these individuals uh, to the same standard outcome as other entities which we regulate, but there isn't the level of prescription there at least to start with. And we'll require that these entities have sufficient capital to ensure they run the business in a sound and prudent manner, and sufficient capital that if the business doesn't succeed, this is a new area, businesses fail, that's part of the market economy, that they've got enough capital to make sure that they can run down, uh, that they can be run down in a safe and prudent way. So we will look at the adequacy of the private key management. We'll ensure that they have policies in place to ensure that private keys could be recovered under stressed scenarios. For example, everyone that's got the codes going down in a plane uh, or getting stuck at Gatwick Airport because the um, air traffic control has gone down. Um, or in the case that business continuity or disaster recovery plans need to be invoked. So when drawing analogies to the field world, I can assure you as a regulator, I'm sometimes actually less worried about the tech background, the IT background, do the, you know, do the people that are applying to us have an ability to deal with cold storage? Just putting the technology to one side, what I'm really asking myself is, are the individuals running virtual asset businesses, uh, firms who are usually undertaking some form of custody function, do they have the broad expertise uh, to run a regulated business as, as I've just outlined? And this, you know, things like areas expertise in corporate governance, risk management, the ability to manage a regulated entity, monitor levels of capital. And these are all things which are required when you become a, a regulated, a financial services regulated business. At the same time, regulation, as I said, is a partnership, uh, particularly in the early stages, so we need to work closely. And our DLT team, and you've got Nathan's, one of our frontline, we might want to wave Nathan. <laughs> uh, we, he, you know, he and the team uh, at the commission are engaging with our firms on a weekly basis. And it's this level of engagement. We really know you, we really know your business. Uh, and, 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 and that means we can work together on how best to respond. As I mentioned earlier, and just in, in conclusion, um, we're not the only regulators, obviously, who are working closely with DLT providers. Um, others are doing some really good thinking on how to deliver objectives. Do our regulatory staff have the right cultural mindset? Uh, we're one of them, we're not alone. And I can safely say that uh, this is probably across all of my career, one of the times that I really do believe that regulators genuinely recognize that technology is creating an imperative on us as regulators to adapt and deliver our approach in groundbreaking ways. So it's gone from something uh, that people are unsure of, a state of evolution, to something that we're embracing and are constantly uh, being on top of. Regulators at national, regional, international level recognize they need to do proactive thinking and they're gearing themselves up to do amazing things uh, with, the, um, with, 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 with people who are running businesses based on the new technology. I recently spoke at an IOSCO panel for regulators, and it was one of the most well-attended regulatory panels I've ever participated in. It was standing room only. There were over 300 regulators. And bear in mind, each regulator will only send about one or two people to these conferences. So you've, you've got, it was a pretty rep internationally representative group. 
all of them, it was standing room only, and they wanted to hear about crypto, crypto regulation and our experience of doing it. And I can, I haven't seen anything like this in all of the 25 years I've been a regulator, and I'm really excited to see where the future is going to take us. Thank you. Thank you so much.